Hi, everybody. Uh, this is the first episode of the new series of the Acoustic Guitar Show. This is a very special one, not just for me, but for everyone, I'm sure. And introduced by this. We have the one and only Stefan Grossman. Ah. Ola. <laughs> Ola. Ola. Stefan. Yeah. I'm fine. Thank you for doing this. My pleasure. This, this is great. This is great because you are such an inspiration for so many reasons. You are probably the first acoustic guitar player I ever heard in my life because of a, of a teacher I had in Rome many years ago. And uh, we have so many friends in common because a lot of friends of mine uh, have been your students because you lived close to Rome years ago. Right. Yes, originally I lived in Grotta Ferrata and then in Montepozio Cattoni. <clears throat> very close. Yeah, beautiful and very close to Rome. So we have many friends in common. Yes. Uh, but you have a very special place in this because we are going to talk about the acoustic guitar in general, not just blues. And uh, But I think, and you will confirm that, if you if you think <laughs> it's the case, I, agree, um, yes. I think that everything started from the acoustic guitar. Uh, in in acoustic guitar, everything started from the blues. The blues uh, guitarists, uh, uh, singers, and players have been among the very first musicians to be recorded in history, in the twenties and in the thirties. So. Um, um, I, Acoustic guitar has a very um, uh, a, a, a very deep influence coming from the blues. Um, I would like to know um, from j just to start um, what what you think about this. I mean, uh, your role in acoustic blues guitar is huge. We can talk about that later. Um, but what do you think about the connection from that? early moments, from those early moments to uh, modern times? Well, the six string guitar was the poor man's piano. So in the turn of the last century, uh, the piano players, they were the, the gentlemen. They were the, the musicians playing in the bordellos, playing uh, in juke joints, etc. But it was the musicians who number one couldn't afford a piano or two uh, were itinerant musicians in other words they traveled a lot around the south well a guitar was a much handier instrument and their playing of the guitar the man who taught me reverend gary davis who was from south carolina uh, and a very important musician guitar player he always referred to the guitar as a six string piano and that in order to be a, a good guitar player, you had to play like it was a piano. Yeah. And it, what was even you know, funnier was he would say, and guitar players, well, we have an advantage because we have three hands. Mm -hmm. And I would ask him, well, what are you talking about? Because a piano player only has two hands. Well, he would say, well, we have one hand to play the chord fingerings, that would be on our left hand. And on our right hand, we have our thumb, and our thumb does the boom chick, boom chick, which is what the piano players of the turn of the last century were doing, because they were having sort of that ragtime syncopation. It wasn't boom, boom, but rather hit a note and then hit a triad. So the sound was boom, chick, boom, chick. And above that, the right hand of the piano player was playing the melody. And for the guitar player, you just would use your index finger. And so therefore you had three hands, index finger, thumb, and the left hand. And when I asked them, I said, well, you only use two fingers, a thumb and an index finger. And he said, yes, that's all I need. And that certainly was all he did need. And what's very unusual is that if you start looking at the great players, legendary players, both black and white, the finger pickers, usually they only use thumb and index. So you have 
of the black musicians. You can think of Reverend Gary Davis. You can think of Mance Lipscomb, Lightning Hopkins. They only use thumb and index. The great white guitar players who, they were taught by black musicians. They played, uh, again, thumb and index. And who are they? Merle Travis, Doc Watson. You know, it's yeah. very interesting. So the approach is very uh, non-classical. It's very non-European classical approach to playing the instrument. Absolutely. Going back even further, the first instrument that the, uh, the slaves were allowed to play on the, the plantations were the fiddle. And then from the fiddle, they adapted to the banjo. So a lot of the banjo styles that came out of the 1850s to the 1890s, they were then adapted onto the guitar. So there are quite a few, you know, when you play banjo, uh, there's a lot of tunings that are being used and they got adopted into the playing of these blues musicians. Now these musicians that we call blues musicians we only do that because what they recorded, what the, the A&R men, the people who found these musicians, uh, all they wanted these men or women to record were blues or ragtime numbers. Most of them, like Reverend Davis, like Robert Johnson, they play polka numbers. Uh, Reverend Davis had a tune called the Italian Rag, and that was literally uh, a it sounded like an, an Italian piece of music. Dance and, tunes. Yeah. So they, they were musicians who could play a, a wide variety of music, but what the record companies wanted, they didn't want them playing a tune that maybe um, Benny Goodman was playing or Paul Whiteman's orchestra. They wanted something unique. So for these blues musicians, they usually had to go into the studio with at least four numbers, four distinct numbers to record. So our, you know, looking back when we try to, um, and this is also a white man's problem, we try to put everything into a bottle to try to yeah. understand. And so we sort of have made it that these musicians only played blues and ragtime, which they didn't. They played all different types of music. What is also interesting is that the black population in America, they really, uh, when you start listening to their recordings, they are, it's intense, all the different styles and techniques. So you have someone as masterful at playing the guitar as Lonnie Johnson, yeah. who's playing single string runs <clears throat> while finger picking. I mean, just amazing. Um, he's the prelude to people like Wes Montgomery, Charlie Christian, T-Bone Walker, Lonnie Johnson was their influence, to someone like Blind Blake, who's just playing out of first position. He's just using first position chords, but his right hand technique is so complicated to be able to, to get that ragtime feel. Because remember these musicians, they were playing in with the hope of getting some money. Yeah, so they sure. were playing the music that was popular. So at the turn of the century, you have players like Mississippi John Hurt, and they're just playing boom, chick, boom, chick with lovely melodies over the bass. And then in the 1915, 1920, the Charleston comes into popularity. And the dance, the Charleston was ba -dum, boom, 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 ba boom. So there you get Blind Blake and what Reverend Davis would call stumbling the bass, where all of a sudden the bass is not just boom, chick, boom, chick, but ba -dum, boom, he's just stumbling it to get that dance rhythm. And again, remember a lot of the music being played by these guitar players was specifically the dance. Yeah. So it's also in that sense, very different from European music that was being played at the same time, which was very, we could say balanced, the bass and the treble, the, their voices, and they're going counterpoint. When you're playing a blues guitar from the 20s, 30s, I would say 90% of the sound is in your thumb. 
and being yeah. able to get a full sound with the thumb and then just the melody lines, well, that's the easy part. But getting that feel, that rhythmic feel, that's the difficult part for a student's musicians to really try to come to grips with. Yeah, this is, this is amazing, heard from you. Um, uh, let's just go back in time. Uh, what, uh, which was your idea of the acoustic guitar? I imagine you started with acoustic guitar, but I might be wrong. I'm not sure about that. But what was your idea of the, of the acoustic guitar when you started? Well, if you, if you I, can remember that. Yes, I can remember back. It's a long time ago then. That, but it, when, oh. I, when I was nine years old, my brother, who's three years older, he was playing saxophone. And I wanted to play an instrument as well. And for some reason, I decided on guitar. I think because my brother Carl had a friend, Kenny, who played guitar. And so I took lessons for about two years and I learned how to read music and just play with a plectrum, strumming chords and playing songs like um, The Autumn Leaves, you know, ah. real copy songs from the 50s. The American Songbook. Yes, no. Then I stopped because it wasn't very much, it just didn't interest me. And then when I was 15, I wanted to take it up again. And my parents who were very leftist, uh, they were, um, fans of Woody Guthrie, of Pete Seeger, the Weavers. And they said, well, you should go down to uh, Greenwich Village. And on Sundays, they have around Washington Square Park, uh, people get together and they play music. And I went down there and I saw these people finger picking. And it, you know, it intrigued me. And fortunately, a friend I had, he had gone to see Reverend Gary Davis and he suggested hey, why don't you go up to the Bronx and Reverend Gary Davis would teach you how to play guitar. At the same time as going up to see Reverend Gary Davis, I had other friends who also played guitar, so we were learning from each other. Very similar to what happened, I think, in, in Rome and in Italy in general in the 70s, where you had players like Reno, um, Peppino, Yet different people who were playing and they were learning from each other as well as learning from old records. And for me, I started learning from my friends, Reverend Davis, but then I started to realize, well, there wasn't just one black great musician. And I yeah. that the hard thing in those years was how did you hear, how could you hear these old recordings from the 1920s? And just as there's a, a blues mafia or finger picking mafia, there's also a mafia of record collectors. And once yeah. you get to be one record collector, and they're very, very enthusiastic about their records. And they, you go to their house and they would just be in heaven that there was someone who wanted to just absorb and listen to all their records that they had. So. Originally, I, heard, I knew the name of Blind Boy Fuller. And so this record collector, Dave Freeman, he had lots of Blind Boy Fuller records, but he also had a Charlie Patton record, a Skip James record, and he had a lot of records by white bands. So I was able to hear Doc Boggs, Carolina Tar Heels. And then he would say, well, why don't you go to my friend who has a lot of old Paramount records? And I would go to, Bernie Klatsko's house and he would play Sun House records. And these are rare records, you know, they're only one or two copies. This is related, uh, I saw Desperate Man Blues, the movie. Did you see that? Well, oh, Joe Buzzard. Yeah. Yes. And Joe was another one. Joe was another one that he was down in the Washington DC area. Um, and when you would go to his house before he would play you records, you had to play and record something for him. <laughs> so you would have to play your guitar and John Fahey was a good friend of Joe Buzzard's. And then he would play you songs, you know. It was very interesting. A lot of the record collectors were interested in the rarity of a record. What was interesting then, these black musicians who were finger picking, 
Um, they were playing in, for instance, Mississippi John Hurt. He played in a, a white band. In other words, the oh. bands, even though down south was very segregated, musicians played together. So Mose Rager, Ike Everly, Merle Travis from Kentucky, they all learned how to finger pick from a black musician that was going through town. And so you have this finger picking. Uh, that Who spread. was that? Who the was that? Of, uh, Mama Mia. I don't remember his name off the top of my head. But he, okay, okay, don't worry. It was a black musician though, who never recorded. You know? Yeah. And likewise, Brownie McGee, he played with a white musician when he was a young boy and learning. So there was interracial and an interchange of musical ideas, but 90% or 95% of the great finger picking that was done in the 1920s and 1930s were done by the black Americans, the, the, the black musicians. There's yeah, not, yeah, almost, yeah. Yeah, there's not very much um, uh, white except Sam McGee, Frank Hutchinson, in the white field of playing. Yeah. But then you get like the Merle Travises, and then that leads into Chet Atkins, and you have what the same finger style, the same technique, but all that happens is that the, the repertoire is different. So instead yeah. of blues, it becomes pop tunes, uh, show tunes, mm -hmm. you know, different type of music. And um, you you lived in a time that was amazing. I mean, you you could name a few of the guys that were picking in the village in those uh, days. Yeah. <laughs> that would be yeah. But you didn't know it was amazing. I mean, the, yeah, one, sure. pers the one person that I would avoid because he was so obnoxious was this guy that whenever there was a a concert or if there was a, a a coffee house and there were people that you could play on stage it was this guy with a funny hat called Bob Dylan. And he <laughs> was just completely like a made up, like a fantasy, you know, character. And, but there was at the, that point, point in the sixties, you had Dave Van Ronk, Mark Spolster, John Fahey. Uh, and what was the amazing thing were the, Old blues musicians from the 20s and 30s, a lot of them were being rediscovered. So yeah. we were able to learn directly one-on-one -on -one with them. Sun House, Robert Wilkins, Mississippi John Hurt, Skip James. I mean, it was just Bucko White, Fred McDowell. I mean, Absolutely. Man wow. You know, just yeah. it was really. And I, to be honest with you, we just thought that was all normal. Yeah, of course you were living that, so yeah. uh, that, that that was happening at the time. Um, we could say, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that the the blues thing with all the blues guys, the blues finger picking thing, with the the wife thing, Chad Atkins and Mur Travis, gave birth to something new. Is that correct to, to think of? Yeah, uh, well, there's there's a lot of merging of different styles so that what happens, um, the first thing that happens in the early 60s is you have someone like John Fahey, who's very yeah. influenced by Elizabeth Cotton, Sylvester Weaver, uh, Charlie Patton, and I'm very knowledgeable about, about what was recorded in the 20s. And he started to make up his own compositions and uh, regular tuning and different open tunings. And he really introduced the guitar amongst the folk audience, not a Nashville audience, but the guitar that you could do a solo concert just playing guitar, not singing, just playing. So that was on one sector of the society. On the other, in the 1950s, you had Merle Travis, Chet Atkins, and they're playing in the Grand Old Opry, and they're playing on all the, these uh, hillbilly uh, TV shows, and they're 
introducing fingerstyle guitar playing uh, to a white audience. The folk people, they sort of started to, you know, they heard Merle Travis and he has a, his style is much, I would say, funkier, much more earthy than Chet Atkins. And they'd say, hey, I'd like to learn a Merle Travis tune. Oh, and that windy and warm of Chet Atkins, <laughs> that's great. I'd like to play that. So they started to become of the guitar, the new players, the contemporary players, they started becoming a merging of white and black styles and music together. At the same time, there was a young man called Dave Laidman uh, who was going to Antioch College and he went over to England uh, on a, a Fulbright scholarship. And he's just a genius of a guitar player but much more interested in economics and in left-wing economics. And he came back to the States after a year and he was playing Maple Leaf Rag. He was playing the entertainer, but just like a piano. So he, what he did, he took the sort of the white approach of Chet Atkins and Merle Travis, but adapted it to the classic ragtime of the 19, early 1900s that was popular like from 1898 to 1915. At the same time, there was a film called um, The Sting. And yeah. The Sting, right? The Entertainer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And with La Stangata, no? Yeah, In sure. Italian. And that, that used the music of Scott Joplin and all of that music became, there was a revival in classic ragtime and for guitar players who were playing any type of finger style, it became <clears throat> absolutely mandatory to be able to play a couple of classic ragtime pieces. And so there was a, 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 a phase of several years, three to five years where a ragtime guitar playing from Blind Blake, Reverend Gary Davis to that approach to playing sort of the Dave Lehman, the Ton Van Berjak, that approach yeah. was very popular. Then the next phase can, comes along with Celtic music and you have uh, Pierre Ben Suzanne comes and uh, really makes a big splash and he's playing in dadgad tuning. And then all of a sudden, a lot of players are saying, well, let's try to delve into the, the amazing repertoire of the Irish people with the hornpipes, the airs, and just beautiful music and putting that on guitar. And so it kept evolving, evolving. And then you had someone and started to do tapping, which is not you can see actually tapping from like the 1930s there's recordings of people tapping but not tapping as um uh, as intricately as michael hedges which he was doing that but at the same time you had rock and roll players who were really tapping you know yeah. they were playing with two, um, stanley jordan so you had yeah. another whole approach of playing guitar and it just became, wow, there are just so many distinct, wonderful ways of playing. And usually what happens is a guitar player a student will try to taste a little bit of this, a little bit of that, like going to a gelateria. You know, you try <clears throat> chocolate and pour the you know, vanilla or whatever, but then you decide, well, I, I like that, so I'm going to really delve into that type of playing the most. Yeah, great. So there is this, um, uh, you are describing this so well. There is this um, a very special moment, I think. Uh, John Fay is really changing the game, right? He's introducing from the old style, he's introducing something new. And in, then, America. in America. In America. At the, same right. time, at the same time he's doing that, Davy Grain. Is doing, he's not doing what Faye's doing, but he's saying, hey, I can play uh, Gotta Get It In My Soul by Charlie Mingus. Oh, I can also write in a, you know, a tune. Let me write, I'll write Angie. 
So he's getting into playing as well and delving into different tunings, just like John Fahey. And then there was another musician in America called Sandy Bull, and he was pretty popular as well. So you had on um, both in England and in America, you had different finger style guitar players exploring new, new areas of playing. And you, whereas Faye was, his basis was the American root sound. Well, for someone like John Renborn or Bert Yansh or Davy Graham, they start off playing like Big Bill Brunzi. You know, that's the funny thing, because the, the first record that really influenced me was Big Bill Brunzi. It influenced mm -hmm. Martin Coffey. It influenced Eric Clapton. That, and it's the same record, which had one side of Brunzi and the other side of Josh <laughs> White. But it took a little bit for Bert and John to say, well, and Martin Coffey, who all began by playing like Big Bill Brunzi and Brownie McGee, to realize, well, that really doesn't, it, it Americanizes our British music, our British traditional music. So they started to search for a specific way of how to be able to play guitar while accompanying or doing solos of the music from Wales, from England, from Scotland, from Ireland. Great. So it's like two distinct things that came up yep. at the same time, almost without, with the same influence, but they didn't know each other at the time. They didn't know each other, right. They didn't know. And in fact, when I, when I went over to England in 67, I think the reason why I was accepted into the British fraternity was that I was sort of like a bridge because yeah. I was... Not uh, uh, I performed, but I was one. I had studied so much about the finger style guitar players of America, and always fascinated about you know how it could be adapted in other countries. And it eventually happened in Italy. We yeah. have a, you know, Italian guitar players who started off. I mean, Reno Brandoni is a good example. He started off learning how to play. When I first met him, he came to me and said. Maestro Stefan, would you say on a bluesman? On a bluesman, this is Sicilia. And I said, Reno. So I, you know, I taught him whatever I could teach him. And eventually he took that music and he's adapted it. And now his compositions are very Italian. Yeah, yet, sure. Yeah. And likewise, also in Japan, there was a student, Tokio Uchida, and there are other really good Japanese guitar players and they're doing the same and likewise in Germany. In other words, the basis may be American roots finger style guitar playing, but then it keeps growing and growing and getting like a big tree. And um, well, you were so well accepted because there were so many great players in the UK at that time, but you were like an alien when they saw you playing <laughs> The blues finger style like that, they went like, oh my God. <laughs> so you can do that on guitar too. And they probably saw that live for the first time. Yes, but also remember in Italy, you know, what happened specifically in Italy, I think the big change happened when the radio stations, they allowed um, private independent radio stations because before that it was all statale. Yeah, and sure. all of a sudden you had lots of stations and each the music started the, for them to play was not just uh, Mina or you know, Batista. You know, they started to play all different types of music. As a result, an audience was developed, was built up. So there was in the 70s and early 80s, you would when we would do concerts there, there weren't 50 people or 100, there were thousands. And so it became very, very popular. And then eventually, I think the radios, that sort of uh, became more uh, in, back to the old fashion where they just started to play the pop music of the day. Yeah. And so there is this moment in the 60s 
uh, where when uh, great songwriters like Johnny Mitchell or uh, in England, I don't know, Nick Drake, I'm thinking of the the greatest examples of songwriters that use the guitar probably like no one did before. Uh, uh, no, no, they were using, they, if you look at the way John Hurt accompanies his music from 1928, and then you listen to Bob Dylan, or you listen to uh, Jackson Brown, or even sure. Joni, Joni Mitchell, they're using the same boom chick, boom chick. You know, they're playing in that style when they're playing acoustic, when they start going over to electric, then they can they start to strum and then you have a, a different sound occurring. You have a band sound, but that finger style approach to playing became sort of the basis of Peter, Paul and Mary, of Jackson Brown, of Gordon Lightfoot, all those musicians, that's the way they were Paul playing. Simon. Right, exactly, Paul Simon with the same alternating bass to Absolutely. begin with. Uh, in the 70s, you started uh, a, record, a record label and uh, the Kiki Mule, right? And uh, you saw a lot of young players coming up and then developing their own style. And many of them started from the blues. Yeah, yeah. And what, what would happen, I was, I left America in 67. <clears throat> And I <clears throat> returned to America in 87, that's 20 years. And now, and since then, we spend at least half of our year, six months at least, either in England or Italy. Those are the, the two countries which we have connections with. All of our children were born in Italy. The, their mother tongue is Italian. Oh, great. <laughs> Well, great, except when you're at a dinner table and you all start talking <laughs> and they're talking Italian and they hear, ah! so that when that happens, I say, talk English. And then the temperature <laughs> goes down, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so at, I forgot what I was trying to get to it. In those years. Um, about, about the Kiki Mule. Uh, I asked it, you about Kiki Mule. So I started to tour all over Europe, and I would meet some incredible guitar players. And some of them wanted to be professional. Others were just amateurs. You know, and there's some great, like Dave Laidman is a fantastic musician, <clears throat> guitar player, but he's an economic professor. You know, Giovanni Pelosi in yeah, Italy. Yeah, he's a good friend. He's a very good guitar player. Yeah, he's absolutely. My he's my dentist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they have people who at a certain point in their life, they decided, well, I won't pursue music as a profession, but just as a hobby. And those people deserve the platform to be heard. And my idea was always, well, let's record them and um, release these records that would also have tablature with them so that other guitar players who wanted to learn how to play, they would have a road map. They would have a map on where to put their fingers and listen to the records. And then, you know, maybe they could learn something. <clears throat> Great. So uh, were you um, aware, I don't know, maybe, uh, mm, um, I don't know if if it was uh, of interest for you, but um, were you aware of the of the many changes that acoustic guitar? Because you know, from Man's Lipscomb to Michael Edges, there is a universe in the middle, and Absolutely. sometimes we wonder uh, how did they get there. Yeah, well, I'm, I think almost everyone started off with. The man's not the with the big Bill Brunzi more than Mans Lipscomb. Mm -hmm. Brunzi was a great influence because when you listen to him, you just want to play like him. You know, he's just so powerful. And from yeah. there, they they develop. But again, there are other styles happening. Just think of the Hawaiian steel string with the slide. So you have at the turn of the last century. That's like 
the popular, popular music that is being played all over Europe, India, America, there are these traveling groups of Hawaiian players playing lap, lap steel. And so that then gets taken up by the African Americans and they start using slide and bottleneck. And so you have another whole way of playing guitar. You have the Lonnie Johnsons who are finger picking, but they're playing single string lines, which lead straight into Charlie Christian, T-Bone Walker, B.B. King. Yeah. So you have, you, then there's a decision to make. Do you want to learn how to finger pick? And then you're basically a solo musician or do you want to learn how to use a plectrum, a flat pick, and play single string lines and play like B.B. King? You know, or do you want to try combining that, you know, the B.B. The King with the finger style? Hmm. Now, I've tried to do that and playing with John Renborn, we tried to do that. And it's it's fascinating. And I I mean, if, I, if I had another life, I would love to be able to learn how to tap. I'd oh, yeah. love to be able to learn how to improvise in the, the jazz world. You know, yeah. there's just so much to learn, so much to learn. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you remember this. I'm going to show you something. Okay. Oh, the, look at that. You held me, among others, uh... Uh, creating this uh, we traded a few emails years ago uh, I had uh, because I wanted to you know uh, the, like the jazz tree or whatever yeah, there, yeah. there are so many but I, I've never seen the acoustic guitar tree so I made up one <laughs> and you were of great help in the very beginning because you told me a lot of things of course you are in the, <laughs> of course, you are in the tree here with other players, uh, but yeah, you know, yeah. I, I, I made uh, this uh, this um, blues, country, and jazz with with all the all the roots uh, uh, down, and then I tried following I don't know my own taste and my own knowledge, um, yep. trying to build everything. Uh, I'm not sure if I ever sent you one, but I I'm going to. And um, oh, good, good. great, and that's wonderful. That's a that's a great thing because people, you know, a guitar student when they're learning, there's just so much to pick from from that tree. You know, yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. And uh, we published that on the on the magazine with Reno, and uh, he, right. he sent me a message uh, a few minutes ago uh, saying to say hello to you, and we you will meet and. <laughs> Uh, at his house in September, <laughs> so yep. he decided. And now, now Reno's a no-no. He's an old man. I know. Non Reno. <laughs> non Reno. Yes. Uh, so that that you were of uh, great help with the acoustic guitar tree, and um, but it's just something I did, you know, for fun or for just to put things together, like uh, something it's like we are doing. Like to Right, but see, that's what's amazing because with gu the guitar really starts to consume you. It's when you're a, a guitar player, it's just such a fantastic instrument that, like you say, you did that tree for fun, but that's a lot of work. Like right? one ear. <laughs> right. That you probably never thought of it as work, but if you were in university, that would have been, you know, a course that you would get an A for, but you just did it because of interest, you know, to learn, because once you get hooked by it, it's really an, an addiction. I think because the actual physical playing of the instrument is really, really uh, very pleasurable and brings a lot of uh, emotion and, and it's very helpful for your sanity to be able to play music. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I would like, with you, I would like to go deeper into the blues thing, but uh, we are mainly focused on acoustic guitar in general, yeah, so that yeah. would take too long, <laughs> way too long. Uh, maybe we'll have another occasion to do that. And uh, One person we shouldn't forget, which is really today, 
incredibly important, and that's Tommy, Tommy Emmanuel. Absolutely. He, he's taken the guitar and has made it so that any audience will go away saying, wow, and I want to learn how to play like that. And so that there are a lot of Tommies in, <clears throat> in I know. countries, you know, but he, he's really, how he has the energy to play so many concerts per year. And he's a superb musician and also a very gracious musician who when he asks someone to come on stage with him, he takes the spotlight from himself and he puts it on his guest. Yeah, I know really, that. And he's really done a, an awful lot for fingerstyle guitar playing. Yeah, I, I will have him in the series. I'm glad you uh, you mentioned him. Uh, I, I used to say, you know, when I try to explain him, uh, he's the only player on earth that can play in front of a thousand of heavy metal fans and then in the middle of the concert you take them away and you let in a thousand of old ladies and right. he, can, he can change just you know from one song to the other and he can entertain both <laughs> and that's something i think is the only one on earth that can do that and well, in fact reverend gary davis used to be able to do that where he would <laughs> play on friday night in a coffee house and then on Saturday, he might uh, do a big concert for college kids. And then on Sunday, he would play in church and he'd play gospel music. And then maybe he'd come back to my house where my parents, who don't know, you know, they didn't know that type of music. And he'd entertain them with songs from the 1920s. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think that's it. Uh, if you have something uh, you would like to say about the acoustic guitar in general, you know, feel free just to do that. Uh, no, I think otherwise. We've, we've done pretty well. This has worked. This modern technology. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is uh, amazing. I will send you the acoustic guitar tree so you can just... Actually, thank you. You can send it to the English address because we'll be there soon. Oh, okay. Oh, Bob, I am sending it uh, through email now. Oh, email. Uh, yeah, I just have files. I don't have a, a print of Who that. Who has paper anymore? <laughs> <laughs> Who has paper anymore? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And, and Nelly, where do you live in Italy? Rome. Yeah, I'm in Rome. In Rome. Ah, That's why we have so many friends in common, because I know most of your students. So. Uh, <laughs> Stefano. Stefano Donega. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. If you're talking about him. And Alberto Lombardi, he's doing wonderful things. Yeah, absolutely. He's yeah. a good friend too. Yeah, we went to Nashville together uh, a couple of years ago when the world was still, uh, you know, a normal place. And yeah, you could travel. <coughs> yep. Yeah, we yeah. went to the Chalakin Festival together. We, yeah. we met there, actually. Thank Great. You. So, uh, I really want to thank you for your time. This has been amazing. Yeah. You are... Uh, you are such an inspiration, and uh, I've well, been we'll waiting for this for a long time. So we'll see each other in Rome and have a plate of pasta. I hope so. I hope so. One occasion could be Reno's house. Who knows? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Who knows? Right. We never know. So I'm going to I'm going to kick you out of the room and say yeah. goodbye in private. Okay. okay? Ciao, ciao. <laughs> So this was the Acoustic Guitar Show, the first episode with the legend himself, Stephen Grossman. Uh, the first episode of the new series dedicated to the great acoustic guitar players. I will see you next time. Goodbye.